So the order is going to be Luigi, who will talk about uh, does ownership affect hospital quality, and then Matt, uh, mortality as a measure of hospital uh, quality, and then Andrew, who's going to say, talk about, answer two questions, two for the price of one, is my doctor any good, will I feel better? I hope it's a more general talk than that, but we'll see. So, so we are basically going back to the first theme of, of the conference, which was on hospital efficiency. You might remember Pedro's uh, presentation. So, so the, the bit that I want to do uh, here is, uh, is about public-private hospitals and whether they have uh, you know, quality differs between uh, uh, these different uh, types of hospitals. Um, so, so I want to try to give like a bit of an overview. So I'm going to squeeze in one of my papers, uh, but the, the, aim, the, the way I designed this presentation was to give also a brief overview of the literature, kind of what we know and what we don't know uh, about this topic. So I'm going to start with uh, just describing across countries public-private uh, uh, provision, mix uh, in provision. Then, uh, uh, you know, if policymakers were around, I would say this is about, then I will touch on some conceptual issues, what economists like to call the theory. Uh, then come back to the empirical evidence and then just quickly draw some, uh, some conclusions. So, so if you look across OECD countries, uh, there is really quite a variety of uh, uh, public-private mix. So, so I think the countries where you have most uh, uh, heterogeneous uh, setup is countries like US, Germany, Italy, France, and uh, Australia. I mean, the, the big categories there are like public, private for profit, and non-profit. So in the US, you have these 60% of non-profit uh, hospitals, and then the rest is public or uh, uh, private for profit. Then if you go to Germany, it's like one third, one third, and one third. Uh, if you move to Italy, because we have this decentralized regional uh, setup with 20 regions and then the mix varies quite a bit across uh, regions. So if you go to Lombardy, again, you have like one third, one third and one third. If you go to Toscany, it's all public. So, so in that sense, uh, Italy is quite rich in terms of uh, uh, heterogeneity in, in the mix. Then you go to France and it's more like 50-50. Uh, so you have like 60% of hospitals are private, but they provide like 40% of activity because they are small hospitals, small private hospitals. Um, and then if you go to Australia, uh, you have uh, yet a different, quite different uh, uh, setup. You know, if you know a bit about Australia, uh, you know that you have this Medicare program, which cover, is a bit quite different from the US because it covers the whole population. Uh, but then six, about 50% of the population has private health insurance in Australia, which is a bit surprising. So it's the, way, the, the reason for that is that the public insurance is really like uh, perceived as low quality. So most people, if they get sick, they try to go to the, to the private hospital. So the private hospitals there are quite important, uh, but they, they function in, in a quite different uh, way. Then you have like a second group of countries like uh, UK or uh, Norway, where they really come from a public uh, provision sort of setup. But then uh, over time, the private sector, the private hospitals started to provide some treatments uh, uh, for the publicly funded uh, public insurance uh, patients. Uh, so, so, so I think both these two countries are um, so a good example of where you start from a public provision setup and then little by little over time, perhaps due to some uh, market reforms, then the private sector start to squeeze in. And then you have some countries like the, the Netherlands where you actually only have private hospitals. So, so that, that, that will not help you to estimate what's the effect of uh, uh, ownership. So, so the point I want to try to make is that there is really quite a lot of uh, variety out there in the mix. The mix between public and private in provision is really quite different uh, uh, across countries. And I think the details uh, probably matter. So I'm now going to move to the theory. I'm going to first do the theory w without equation. So, so if you think about, okay, who should provide the higher quality? Is it the public hospitals or is it the private hospitals? So again, uh, if you think about people, you know, sometimes people think uh, about this issue in an ideological way. So if you're like maybe leaning more towards the, the, the right, then you say you know, the private hospitals are better. And then you say, well, what's the argument? And they say, well, the private hospitals, they have to compete for business and therefore they have to provide a higher quality, otherwise they will not get the contract. That, that, that's, that's, uh, that, that's the argument. Then you talk to, to the other guys uh, who maybe are leaning slightly towards left, uh, and then they say, you know, that it's a bad idea to have private hospitals because what they will do is that they will skimp on quality because they are for profit. So that they care only about profits, and the way you get more profits is by reducing quality. So which of these two arguments uh, is uh, correct? So, 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 I've tried, so I've thought about these issues for quite a long time. So this is 
a one slide model, uh, which is uh, uh, a sketch of a model which I've written with uh, uh, Kurt Breck and uh, Odrune Strame, we, we published in, G in Gibo a couple of years ago. So this is the usual Ellis and Megayer model that probably some of you are familiar, where you have like altruistic uh, providers, so you have uh, the, this is the, the payoff function of the hospital, uh, which depends on, on profits, which depends on quality. I, I will be unpacking this in just a second. Uh, and then there is, uh, I always think about ho hospitals having uh, altruistic motives, so that you know, they really, these doctors, they really care about uh, giving quality to, to, to the patients. So that, that's the alpha times the benefit uh, uh, from treating the patients. And then there are some disutility costs. You know, the, the doctor have to focus while uh, they are treating the patients and they, they have to try not to forget the scissors in, in the belly of, of the patient. So, so, so that, that's the, this uh, e, e function. So, so, so then the, the, the profit function is within the RG payment system. Uh, I think this is a fairly standardized, so it's just like a fixed tariff P minus some cost of treating the patients, which is increasing quality, times demand minus some fixed cost of quality. You can think that as MRI machines, CT scans, uh, and so forth. So if you take that for further condition of, of quality, uh, you obtain this for third condition, which tells you that the marginal benefit from quality uh, is equal to the marginal disutility plus the marginal pro profitability. So, so at that point, you can do some comparative statics. So the way you, I capture the, the profit versus non-profit uh, motive is through this delta parameter. So if you think about a hospital who is for profit, then delta is equal to one. Uh, and then if, uh, if you have uh, a non-profit motive or you are a public hospital, uh, then delta is, is strictly less than one. So by checking what happens to delta, uh, changing delta, you can check what happens to, to quality. That's the comparative statics. And then if you do that, what you find is, uh, is, uh, is an you have an indeterminate effect. So what's happening there? I think uh, what's happening is there are those two effects that I showed you in the previous slide in, in words. So suppose that there is no altruism. So you really think as hospital as private firms, which I think is not the case, but uh, you know, sometimes people think, okay, suppose that hospital is just like under any other firm uh, in, in the economy, then you put uh, uh, alpha to zero. And then but what that says is that, uh, well, the marginal benefit from the marginal profit from quality is equal to some marginal cost so if you make the hospital less uh, uh, profit-oriented by increasing delta, uh, that will mean that quality will go down. So that's the profit motive. So when, uh, in, in the story I told you before, that, that, that was precisely the argument. If you, are, uh, uh, if you, have to, uh, if you compete for business, uh, that's your motive for increasing quality. If you are a public hospital who don't care so much about, uh, uh, about profits, that, that will reduce your incentive to compete uh, on quality. Now suppose that you make the other extreme assumption so that you have uh, effort equal to zero and alpha is a large uh, number. Then actually, if you think about these public hospitals that they're really trying to save all these patients and uh, you know, maybe I think as them working at some sort of negative uh, profit margin so that, you know, that that marginal extra unit of care that they provide is, is where they're making losses as opposed to, uh, to profits. Then if you now introduce the profit constraint, that actually that means that the public hospitals will care a little bit less about this, uh, pro these uh, losses that they're going to make, and that will push uh, uh, quality high, higher. So, so, so that, that, that's, uh, that's the argument that uh, private for-profit hospitals skimp on quality. That, that, that's the mechanism that you can see when alpha is quite high. So that's the end of the theory. So, so to me, that, that's, uh, that's how you can think in a formal way about uh, uh, whether for-profit hospitals uh, uh, provide higher or lower quality. I want to now to discuss some other issues that also relate to public versus private, uh, which are the other uh, common dimensions which are mentioned uh, in, in, this, uh, in this context. So, so I think what most people tend to say is that, uh, okay, private hospitals, they should be better at keep, costing down, keep costs down. So you know, people think, okay, they, they are more efficient because uh, uh, you know, they, care, they have to maximize their profits and the best way to maximize the profit is by uh, reducing costs. While the public hospitals, because they don't care so much about profits, uh, th then they will have weaker uh, incentives uh, to do so. I mean, that, that's again how uh, some people think about it. Uh, again, if I think about public hospitals, uh, I sometimes think that they have this large excess demand and they cannot turn necessarily down lots of patients. So they actually, do they have a choice of being inefficient or do they have to be efficient because that's the only way to manage these large excess demands? Uh, so so that, I think that would push in the opposite direction so that perhaps you, know, you could argue that public hospitals could be more efficient than the private ones. 
And then you could say, well, actually, what does the empirical evidence uh, say about this? So if you look at this review by Bruce uh, Hollingsworth in Health Economics in 2008, where he reviewed all possible uh, studies on stochastic frontiers comparing public and private hospitals, uh, I think what he finds, if anything, is the public hospitals who tend to be slightly more efficient, uh, or, or, but there is still quite a lot of heterogeneity in, in the findings. So, so I think that that's uh, uh, what I know about uh, the, the cost uh, containment or efficiency uh, bit. The other things that people often say about private hospitals is that they cream, cream scheme, that they will always try to get the, the, the less severe patients. Uh, I think that that's uh, what many people have in mind. Uh, with the one project that uh, we did with Andy a few years ago, uh, I think we were wrestling with this issue and uh, it didn't look as simple as that in the sense that there were, I think, at least two issues. One was, uh, can the private hospital contractually treat the very severe patients? If you are like a small private hospital, you don't have the access to the emergency, actually maybe by the contract, you may not be allowed to treat the more uh, severe patients. So, so that's quite different from crim, crim scheming. Crim, crim scheming means that the hospital that will try to avoid some patients. Another thing is to say, well, by the contract, you cannot uh, treat them. So, 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 so that's... Uh, uh, that's again introduces, I think you have to check the, the details about uh, crim scheming. And then is it the case that public hospitals perhaps might also do a little bit of crim scheming in the sense that if they're all paid by DRGs, they might also have an incentive uh, to, to not to treat the more severe expensive uh, patients. Uh, so, so I think that that's, uh, uh, that's one bit that uh, we have this idea in mind, but perhaps uh, uh, we need to check a bit more carefully whether this is w why this is happening. I think probably the data do confirm that they have a lighter case mix, uh, but I think maybe uh, as, an, as economists, maybe we quite quickly say, oh, it's all cream scheming, but maybe there may be other reasons on top of cream scheming. A couple of other things that also are said about uh, public versus uh, uh, private uh, hospitals is that, uh, well, one of the reasons why uh, public hospitals or non-profit hospitals might have higher quality is that they tend to attract the more dedicated uh, doctors. So there is this paper by Philipson in Journal of Public Economics where they try to show that uh, if you have uh, different types of, hosp uh, of doctors, the more motivated and the lo less motivated, they will self-select them into the non-profit hospitals. So, so that might be the reason why the non-profit might have a, a stronger incentive to provide higher quality. And the last bit that I want to mention is, uh, is the different payment rules. So in some countries, public and private uh, providers might be paid in the same way, but in some other contexts, they might be paid differently. So, so, so if you find differences in, in, in quality or uh, cost containment incentives, that, that might be another source of, of heterogeneity. In the study I'll show you uh, later, uh, we can rule that out uh, for, from, uh, as a possible explanation from our study because they were paid the same. So that's an important uh, uh, thing to check. So again, moving to the empirical evidence, what, what does the, the empirical evidence say about the difference in qualities across uh, these public and private uh, hospitals? So there is this nice uh, uh, systematic review in uh, uh, health economics uh, by Karen Eggleston, where she reviews uh, all the 30 studies that have been conducted in the US uh, on checking differences in quality uh, across uh, public, for-profit and non-profit hospitals. Uh, and, uh, well, the, the results are a little bit inconclusive in the sense that, uh, that the main conclusion seems to be that it depends on, uh, uh, on data, sources, uh, time period, region, so, so it's, it's all really a bit uh, uh, mixed. And though I'll show you a slide uh, uh, just in a second, most of the studies, they kind of show a zero effect. Um, I want to mention a couple of uh, uh, studies by Picone and, and Shen, just because methodologically they do something a bit different. So the, the Eggleston paper mostly reviews uh, cross-sectional data. That's quite natural in the sense that you know, if you are a for-profit hospital, you tend to be a for-profit hospital. You don't change over time. But apparently, in the US, uh, at some point, some hospitals changed status. So they went from non-profit to for-profit, or they could go for, from for-profit to non-profit. So you could exploit uh, that, that change in the panel uh, data setup, and that uh, might help you to control for uh, unobserved uh, uh, severity. So, so in, in those studies, what they tend to find is that the non-for-profit hospitals, they tend to do better than the for-profit ones. So that, that's, uh, uh, that's uh, in favor of the non-profit uh, hospitals. So this is the, 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 the big tables from, uh, from, uh, from uh, Karen Eggleston uh, uh, paper. So this is for-profit versus non-profit. 
uh, and this is mostly mortality. And you can see that most of the studies are around zero with, you know, these are the confidence intervals. So, so that, that really doesn't seem to suggest a great deal of differences uh, between uh, uh, for-profit and non-profit. And if you look at public versus non-profit, also you see lots of, uh, uh, lots, lots of zeros. Um, what about non-US literature? I, th I think for, if you step outside the US, uh, there are fewer studies. Uh, I think maybe that's where uh, maybe in a few uh, OECD or European countries there might be scope for uh, running of some a few additional studies also because the institutional details in, in these countries are quite different. So there is one study for France which shows that for profit hospitals in France they tend to do, to do better than non profit, not, not for profit ones, in public hospitals uh, where quality is measured as uh, the usual heart attack uh, uh, mortality rate. But the thing to keep in mind in France at that specific time is that the private hospitals and the public hospitals were paid differently. So, you know, as you would expect, the public hospitals would be more like fixed budget sort of hospitals and the private one, they were more fee for service. I think now they have unified the system so they are all under some sort of DRG payment. Uh, there is one study for uh, Australia, which uh, is a quite similar result. So again, lower heart attack readmission or mortality for private hospitals. So in these two cases, the private hospitals, they tend to do better. And then there is one study from Taiwan where, where you find the opposite finding, where the not-for-profit hospitals, they do better than the for-profit ones, uh, where here is mortality for stroke and uh, cardiac uh, patients. So let me then move to, to, to the study that, that uh, we conducted with uh, uh, Giuseppe, uh, Hugh and, uh, and Niels. So, so in, uh, uh, in England, at some point, uh, uh, you know, the, most, the, the private providers slowly started to enter the, the NHS uh, uh, sector. So before 2002, there were just very few patients that were treated in private hospitals. And then in 2004, uh, they, they, they were allowed in. They are not called private providers. Uh, because in England is, uh, you always have to come up with some uh, incomprehensible uh, th uh, terminology. Uh, it's like driving on the left, or right? Uh, so, and, then, uh, and then in 2007 and 8, uh, patients had the choice, so they could chase any, choose uh, any provider, including the private uh, providers. So by the, by the 2013, about 10% of, of the NHS patients, they were treated by private providers. And, and these uh, patients were all elective patients. So, so I think that that's an important uh, uh, point because if you compare to the other studies, you know, they were all looking at differences in mortality. Uh, and then if you think about uh, these 10% elective patients, well, you know, most of the times no one dies out of uh, an elective patient. The, the, the mortality risk is really negligible. So, so if you're going to do a study that compares quality between the uh, private providers and, uh, and public ones, then you have to come up with a different uh, quality metric. So, so in, this, uh, uh, in this paper, we're going to use uh, uh, emergency readmissions rates. So, 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 but that's an important, uh, uh, a simple point. So, so that, that's what we use. This is a fairly standard uh, quality measures when you have the mortality risk is, is negligible. You can look at emergency readmissions within 28 days. Uh, we wanted to make a statement about the whole private sector as a whole, so we tried to include uh, all, the, all the treatments that they provide. So this is around, uh, uh, this is like across many uh, DRGs or HRGs. Uh, and it's across many hospital sites, and we just use a cross-sectional uh, cross in 2013. And again, the, the point to emphasize on the, on the incentive sides is that uh, the payment system at that point in time was, uh, was unified, so that, so that uh, private hospitals and public hospitals, they were getting exactly the same DRG tariff uh, for, uh, for, a given, uh, for a given treatment. So, so if we find some differences, uh, then uh, th that cannot be due to, to differences in, uh, in payment system. So, so the, the, the methods uh, is a, uh, it's a simple cross-sectional model. So this is the uh, uh, readmission, rate, readmission for patient I in HRG uh, J. So we have a bunch of uh, HRG fixed effects. This is just a dummy variable for private versus public hospitals. And then we have a lot, lots of covariates, uh, and then there is uh, the error term. So, so I'm going to show you three sets of results. One where I only include the, the uh, HRG fixed effects. Uh, another one where I add all the other covariates. Uh, and then we can see how, how the effect changes. And then we, because we are concerned about unobserved uh, severity, then we also do an instrumental variable approach where we, as, a, as an instrument, we use the difference in the distance between the closest public hospitals and private hospitals, uh, which is 
fairly standard in this type of uh, uh, on this in this type of studies. Um, we also do matching, uh, though, though that, in my experience, uh, that never makes much of a difference. So, so that that's not where the, the difference will there will be big differences. Okay, so, so this is just a couple of descriptive statistics. There is just a couple of numbers I want to show you. So if you say, well, what's the 30, 28 days emergency readmission rate in, in NHS public providers? Well, that's about 2.2%. That, that, that's uh, the underlying uh, risk. And then if you look at private providers, then this is 1.4%. So, so you can see that, uh, you know, just that from the descriptives, the private providers seem to be doing <coughs> better. So some of this could be just uh, uh, due to uh, different uh, DRGs, different treatments, different compositions, but that's quite easy to, uh, to, to take care of that. So, so if you run the OLS regression of uh, the, this is linear, linear probability models of uh, emergency readmission uh, rate, and you control only for the uh, HRGs, uh, then the difference is, remains uh, stable. Actually, it becomes slightly bigger. So it, this is close to, to 1%. So it's 0.95 uh, percentage points. So what about if you now add all the covariates? And I think we have uh, a pretty good list of covariates. So we also include uh, a number of past uh, emergency admissions, which I think takes a bit of time to construct, but uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good measure. So once you add all the covariates in, the, the, the coefficient goes down a little bit, but it's still there. So still the private provider seems to be doing uh, 0 0.7 percentage points better than, than the, pub the public one. But once you do, you, once you do the, the IV, uh, then the effect goes away. So, so, that the, the, so there seems to be unobserved uh, severity. Uh, and, uh, and once you control for that, uh, actually, the, there is no difference in the qualities between the, the two types of hospitals. So, so I think that's the main uh, result. So maybe it is consistent with all these uh, studies that uh, they show that there isn't that much of a difference across uh, other countries. So, so that's, that's uh, what we find. So I think I've run a little bit over time, but just to conclude with a couple of uh, messages. So I think there is quite a lot of uh, uh, variety and richness in the institutional setups across uh, uh, a few different countries. Uh, the evidence seems to be mixed, to say, to say the least. Probably we don't know that much about the mechanism, so we can document pretty well whether there is a difference between uh, uh, quality in public and private, but we don't know what's uh, going on uh, in, in detail. And uh, I think there is uh, fewer studies uh, across uh, uh, Europe. Maybe that's not... Uh, uh, there isn't like no strong rationale for that being the case because I think these days we all have a good administrative databases. So maybe you know this, there might be scope for next European uh, project. Uh, though I'm not sure whether uh, the UK will be part of it or not. Questions? Any questions? Thank you, Luigi. Uh, is it the is it the, the no the the results that you presented? Are these the these independent sector providers that were set up? Is it true or not that they were set up to sort of take care of less severe cases? Like that was the the philosophy a, a bit in which they were set up that to treat sort of to reduce the waiting the waiting list they would set up or, or no? You think they were set up more generally? To, yeah, I, I think it depends how you think about the less severe in the sense that if you say less severe in the sense <clears> that uh, what they were doing was uh, routine uh, elective procedures, that, that's what they were doing, cataracts, hip replacement, but all sort of orthopedics uh, sort of uh, procedure. I mean, if you go through all the HRGs, which we did, it was mes mostly ophthalmology, orthopedics. So, so if that's what you mean by li lighter, that, 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 and that, that also matches with the waiting time story, in the sense that that's where you had longest waiting time. Then if instead you mean within those HRGs, uh, do they have uh, lighter case mix? Here, you, you, we can see this uh, in, the, in the descriptive statistics. So if you look at uh, age or female, like uh, the, the elixir, they look all pretty similar. The one that looks different is uh, past hospitalizations. So clearly the public uh, uh, hospitals, they had patients that were more severe in terms of they had a larger number, the, the patients that they were treating, they had a larger number of uh, uh, pri uh, uh, prior uh, hospitalizations where the prior hospitalizations are, are uh, uh, measured correctly in the sense that you know, if you go to a private hospital and then you had lots of hospitalizations before in the public hospitals, that's all included. So it's really a good, good proxy of severity. So, so, th so that's the only place where I can see it, that, that there is something going on there. Uh, the, the rest look, uh, look, look all a bit similar. So they didn't have more comorbidities, for instance? 
Uh, I think the com uh, yeah the comorbidities uh, like you know, if if that's summarized in the Elixhauser uh, index, uh, this looks quite similar. Zero, uh, 68 and 67. Looks could, similar. could I ask a related question? Yeah. It sure. depends on how you define private in the study, but I, I heard and I don't know if it's true that the private providers could turn away people more easily so that they'd select on people. So. I mean, that's the concern about the criminal skimming. So, so, so in a way, uh, again, that that's the only place where I can see it is through the, the, um, through the past emergency uh, admissions. I cannot see in the data, I cannot see it anywhere else. Okay, let's pick this up later and move to the second um, speaker, who's Matt, who's going to talk about mortality as a performance indicator quali of quality. Right, so... Uh, Thanks very much for inviting me to do this. I'm going to talk about um, the issue of using mortality as a measure of hospital quality um, and talk about some of the work we've been doing looking at, um, a, at what we think is a, a, an under-recognised under problem with using hospital mortality. So I think most of you will probably be familiar with the background on this. So hospital mortality rates are quite widely used as a measure of quality. And one of the reasons why is they're relatively easy to compute, um, so regulators and policymakers can, uh, can use them. And in England, basically, we continue to publicly report them, and they are officially used as a, as a smoke alarm, so that hospitals that have high mortality rates, basically, if they have higher than expected rates, it's a reason for further inquiry. Um, and the point I really want to emphasise, and I'll do this through a number of examples, is yes, there's a, an adjustment for case mix, and in this way it's sort of a bit complementary with Luigi's talk, um, that this really shows the inadequacy of some of our case mix adjustments. <clears throat> but importantly for this talk, it's um, a comparison of mortality rates amongst the population that are admitted. And I want to talk about how hospitals control that population. So this is a standard uh, way of analysing mortality. This is what it's done in, in England. Um, so essentially it's creation of a funnel plot. And you have along here the expected number of, of deaths versus the actual number of deaths. And then there are these control limits. So that's the upper control limit. And essentially, it's a smoke alarm if the hospital lies above the upper control limit. So it's said to have a higher number of deaths than you would expect through just natural chance. There's lots of criticisms of their use, and these are the ones I'm, I'm not really going to cover. So first of all, mortality is itself a pretty rare event, so it's quite a, a crude measure of quality. There are lots of causes of death that are beyond the hospital's control. So if we think about hospitals as being somewhere where people are taken because of a lack of <laughs> palliative care provision, um, that's out of the hospital's control. And where people have tried to do work to look at, looking at case records to see how many deaths could have been avoided, they generally come up with quite low rates. So I think 3.5% was the most recent consensus. And those criticisms then relate to this, this problem with case mix adjustment that even with the rich set of variables that Luigi showed, you're still finding there's, there's a potential for unmeasured differences in severity. So what we're focusing on is, is thinking about the stages which lead to the mortality rate as is measured for the hospital. And what you can imagine is you have a series of stages. So you first of all have patients choosing to attend a, an emergency department. We're going to focus only on the emergency admissions at the moment. So you first of all have patients choosing to attend an emergency department and then you've then got another stage where the hospital decides which of those they're going to admit. The patients then enter this pool which is the pool of patients that are admitted and then the quality of care then determines the potential flow of survivors from that rate. So Essentially, what most of this literature does is to focus on that blue box there. So amongst the population that have been admitted, what is the death rate? And what we're going to do is just look one stage further, is look at the individuals who turn up at an emergency department and see how 
the decision that hospitals make about admission varies. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples where we've looked at this. The first one was where we were looking at um, the weekend mortality effect, which some of you might know about. So this is motivated by a paper that appeared in the British Medical Journal um, by Nick Fremantle and colleagues. And actually, this was just the latest in a series of papers which showed that if you were admitted to the hospital at a weekend, you had a higher mortality rate than if you were admitted during the week. And actually, they were quite careful uh, about how they interpreted that, but they did include some quite alarming statistics. So the analysis shows that around 11,000 more people die each year uh, because they're admitted to hospital on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or Monday. So note the extension of the weekend to four days. Wouldn't that be nice? Um, but they did say it's not possible to ascertain the extent to which they're preventable. Um, on the one hand, and on the other hand, they said, from an epidemiological perspective, the statistic is not ignorable. And they said that it raised questions about the quality of care in hospitals at weekends. So that's the authors. The Secretary of State, so our, um, our health minister, went a little bit further. So I'll show you what he said, which is, so that's Mr. Hunt. So he says, let me give the Honourable Lady the facts, which is just so aggressive to begin with. So according to an independent study, there's 11,000 excess deaths because we do not staff our hospitals properly at weekends. I think it's my job and the government's job to deal with that and to stand up for patients. And then in case they haven't gone far enough, the reality is that we have about 200 avoidable deaths every week in our hospitals. It's the same in other countries but it's a global scandal, and I want England and our NHS to be the first to put it right. So that's pretty damn bold, isn't it? So the press reaction. So we ended up with headlines like this. Uh, and it was lovely to dig this out because Prince, Harry, Prince Harry's party-loving girl was also a headline on that day. Um, but we shouldn't underestimate her, so there, there, was, there was all this stuff in the press which I think was genuinely alarming for uh, patients, but it also led to one of our first doctor's strikes that we'd had for many, many years. So the criticism of hospital staff, particularly around doctors not being in hospitals at weekends to ensure that patients weren't dying, was a really controversial thing to say. And this was a, a dispute not with the senior doctors, but with the, the less senior doctors, what we call junior doctors. And they were essentially disagreeing about defining the weekend, but also at what point during the weekend doctors should get a pay premium for working antisocial hours. So here this block is essentially showing you from 7 a.m. down to 7 a.m. the next day. Here's the days of the week. And you can see under the current rates, basically, standard days were 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday to Friday. And outside of that was a pay premium. The government used this argument that hospitals were unsafe at weekends to propose a different definition of when doctors should be paid a premium for working out of hours. So essentially they said that Saturday is now just like any other day. And essentially, between the hours of 7 a.m. and 9 p.m., there should be a slight premium, but this is when doctors needed to be in hospitals. The BMA suggested just that we simply, this is the doctor's trade union, simply that we move the, day, the, the hour down a little bit, so we do 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. So this, this stuff was very controversial. So what did we do? So we, we took a similar data set to what Luigi has talked about, so we looked at all patients who were attending emergency departments across England. So we have 12.7 million uh, attendances at an emergency department, and of those, 4.7 million people are admitted. And what we looked at was the absolute numbers of deaths and the absolute numbers of admissions, and then we undertook the standard risk adjustment that this literature does. So I'll just walk you through this. So essentially what we do is we pull each of the weekdays, we're doing a standard definition, so Monday to Friday is a weekday, and then Saturday and Sunday is the weekend. 
And the first thing we look at is whether there's a difference in the volume of people who are turning up at emergency departments seeking care. And you can see there's a slight increase at the weekends, but it's not very much, just barely 1%. Then we look at the volume of admissions. So just under a third of patients are admitted, but you can start to see the issue appearing here. So there's, there's much fewer admissions on a typical weekend day than there is on a typical weekday. So the crude admission rate, so we're not adjusting for patient characteristics here, but you can already see the differences A 30% admission rate during the week and a 27.5% admission rate at weekends. The actual number of deaths is quite similar. So on a typical weekday, people who are admitted, 388 of them will go on to die, whereas on a weekend day, 378 of them will go on to die. So actually there are fewer deaths rather than more deaths at weekends. And then you can see, if you express the death rate as a proportion of the people who have turned up at hospital seeking care, the rates are very similar. So it's 1.03% versus 0.99%. It's only when you express the death rate as a proportion of the people at the hospital is admitted that you start to see an excess death rate. So here you can see during the week it's 3.42, at the weekend it's 3.59. So essentially the issue is we're dividing through by a smaller number at the weekend. And then you can show with risk adjustment, essentially those statistics remain the same. So when we risk adjust, we have an odds ratio of being admitted of 0.946. If you choose to express that as a proportion of the admissions, then you do have an excess mortality rate. So the odds ratio is 1.055. But if you're a patient and you're making the decision about whether to turn up at, a, at an emergency department, then your mortality rate is not significantly elevated. So even accounting for your patient characteristics, if you make the decision to turn up at an emergency department, essentially you are at the same risk. So the implications then are volumes of attendances are quite similar. Turning up at an emergency department at the weekend is not associated with an increased mortality risk, but you are facing a lower probability of being admitted to hospital. And the explanation that we have for the higher mortality rate is that hospitals have a more stringent threshold at the weekend, and therefore the patients who are admitted at the weekend will tend to be of higher severity, and that's not picked up in the figures. Nonetheless, I suppose just to try and hammer this point home, despite, I mean, it's our study, but other studies have shown similar things. Despite that, the NHS has introduced new clinical standards. So at the weekend, patients can still expect to be seen by a, a consultant, that's a senior doctor, they can still expect to be seen by a senior doctor within 14 hours, that they can have access to diagnostic services like x-rays seven days a week, that consultants are on site to kind of order interventions at the weekend, and that everyone will be reviewed by a senior doctor at least once or twice a day, no matter the day. Now those standards, of course, seem quite sensible, but we might expect if the weekend mortality effect is just a statistical artifact, that there'd be no association with mortality. And so this is essentially just to show you that that is indeed the case. So here we've plotted for each of, the, uh, each of the four standards, so time to first consult and review down to ongoing review. And in each case, we've looked at the extent to which the mortality rate is higher at the weekend in this hospital, and we've plotted that against the extent to which the hospital is achieving these standards. And in no case do we find any significant relationship. Two of them are positive and two of them are negative. So that seems to be consistent with what we're trying to fix is a statistical issue rather than a genuine quality of care issue. And then I just want to finish up with what I think might be wider implications of this issue about the admission threshold. So as well as trying to explain this difference between mortality between weekends and weekdays, there's also potential that if hospitals are differing in their admission rates, 
that might account for some of the variation that we see across hospitals in the mortality rate. So if you're a hospital that's admitting more low severity patients, so if you have a slightly lower threshold, then you will also have low mortality. Whereas if you're a hospital that essentially uses its resources more tightly, then you could end up being flagged as being poor quality because you'll appear to have a higher mortality rate. And so just to show you in, in the data here, we're just plotting how the admission rate, so this is the proportion of patients who turn up at an emergency department who get admitted. This is the amount of variation there is between hospitals in England. And this is the variation in the mortality rate. So actually there's more variation in your admission rate than there is in the mortality rate. And what's quite nice is that this variation across hospitals is very persistent. So if you're a high admission rate hospital, you've been a high admission rate hospital for the last five years. And then if you use that to look at this system where we flag hospitals as being a cause for concern because you're a high mortality rate hospital, if you compare that against the admission rate, you can show that 11 of the 14 hospitals that are currently flagged as being high outliers, so 11 of those 14 have standardized admission rates that are above the average. And if you look at 12 of the 15 hospitals who've been flagged as having low mortality rates, they have higher than average standardized admission rates. So there does seem to be a plausible correlation here that one of the reasons we see this variation in mortality is because hospitals are very different in who they select to be admitted. So that's me finishing up. So points I've been trying to convey, essentially hospital mortality rates are widely used as a quality measure and there's lots of reasons why we should be skeptical about them. But we think one of the reasons that has been generally under-recognized is that hospitals control who goes into the pool of patients on which mortality is measured. And what we seem to be finding in, this, in, in the data in England at least is that mortality rates are higher at the weekend because the admission rate is restricted, not necessarily because of the quality of care people get when they are admitted, and that mortality rates appear to be higher at some hospitals because they've got more restrictive policies on who they admit. Again, not necessarily because of the quality of care that those patients get after they've been admitted. Right, I'm going to, to answer these two questions. Um, is my doctor any good and will I feel any better? So I'm going to start with a bit of a story of tragedy. Um, so in 2001, this inquiry published... Uh, there was a governing inquiry into paediatric open heart surgery at the Bristol Royal Infirmary. This was the most expensive government inquiry into health care that had ever been conducted at the time in the UK. And it was an inquiry into um, the deaths of children aged under 12 months who'd had open surgery. And what it found was 30 to 35 more children under that age had died after open heart surgery than had been, would have been expected given their case mix in a, in a four-year period. And it came down very hard on the institution, um, the, institu the, the, the people working in, in the British, uh, the Bristol Royal Infirmary, um, particularly singling out these individuals. Jane Wishart was the cardiac consultant who basically, whose, uh, whose hands these children died. But he was also the medical director. And the medical director had the position in the hospital to investigate any complaints about malpractice or any sort of complaints that patients made. So essentially, he was left to investigate himself. And of course, he didn't act objectively because he was both the focus of the complaints and the one who was supposed to work them out, sort them out. Could have been the chief executive that sorted everything out. And he also came into criticism. This was John Roylance. He was criticised because he basically believed his medical director, who was his friend. Other members of the medical profession in, within the hospital also protected themselves, protected the chief doctor and protected one another. They saw that things were going on, they didn't act, 
children continued to die. And when the complaints were taken by, to the Department of Health, by Stephen Bolson, who was the um, whistleblower, the person responsible at the Department of Health took no action either, because he didn't read the complaints. Now, I wrote about this seven, uh, some 15 years ago, so if you want the full story about what happened at the Bristol Royal Infirmary, you can read that in um, this article. I'll show you all the references at the end of this talk. The cardiac doctors reflected on what had happened subsequent to the inquiry uh, reporting in 2001. So in Great Britain and Ireland, we have a Society for Cardiothoracic Surgery. And essentially what they did was decide, actually, this cannot be allowed to happen again. It cannot be the case that if things are going badly wrong amongst one of our profession, in one of our hospitals and children are dying, we cannot not have sight of this, we cannot have early warning, and we cannot allow the medical profession to protect itself at the expense of patients. So what they decided to do was to start collecting and analysing the performance of their own membership other cardiothoracic surgery, surgeons in Great Britain and Ireland. Now, this had been done before. It happened before in New York when the New York Times got hold of information about the mortality rates for cardiothoracic surgeons working in New York State and published them in its newspaper. And this was found to improve outcomes, but there was an adverse effect in that doctors in New York State started to select the easy cases. And that's been written up by Dronov and others in the Journal of Polit Political Economy, which is, of course, widely read by cardiothoracic surgeons. Um, they did realize what had gone on and said, well, the problem here, of course, is a failure of risk adjustment. So what they did was, was in the UK, was to look at changes in predicted and risk-adjusted mortality for 24,000 patients treated by the 30 surgeons working in Great Britain and Ireland, subsequent to publishing risk-adjusted mortality rates. And they found that publication of these results was associated with decreased risk-adjusted mortality, as had happened in New York, but that there was no evidence that fewer high-risk patients were undergoing surgery because of publication. Because their risk adjustment was sound. And it was sound because all the doctors within the Society for Cardiothoracic Surgery signed up to the risk adjustment, they scrutinised it, they bought into it, and they owned the whole process. Mortality probably decreased because, not because it was published and that patients then decided I'm going to go to this doctor rather than this doctor, but rather because doctors competed with one another and actually thought, why is my risk adjusted mortality higher than my colleagues? Let's find out, let's talk to each other and let's find out whether we can do better individually and as a society. So these were published by the cardiothoracic surgery found to improve mortality and that there was no risk adjustment as a result. This then was rolled out across the whole of England. And now you can find details of each individual doctor's performance across all specialties in England. So about 18 months ago or so, my mum was going to have a, um, a knee replacement and she was getting anxious about it. She was asking me, I know where my doctor is, but is he any good? So I thought, well, of course, I can find out. So I looked him up. So this was my mother's doctor, David Duffy. Now, he works in quite a small hospital, Harrogate Hospital, the closest hospital to where my mother lives. She was getting her knee replacement. It was planned for August. 
August, it's quite a bad time to get a knee replacement or to go to hospital. Because in England, that's when all the student doctors change their rotation and start to work in hospitals. So there's a reasonable chance that you get operated on by somebody for whom it's their first operation. And we know that the probability of success is higher the more times that the doctor has done something, right? So you don't want to be the first person treated by that particular doctor. We know that there is a volume outcome effect. So I was able to look up this, this doctor and just find out how many similar operations he'd done. So there's this web page, you just look him up, you find out what his number is, and then you can go to the National Joint Registry and look him up there. And they have information about where he's practiced, which hospitals he's worked in, what his activity has been like over the last year and what it's been like over the last th uh, three years. And for this particular doctor, he's done hip replacement, worked on hips and knees. So if we look at his activity in terms of his knees, which is what my mum was, was doing, find out that he's done in the last three years 278 knee replacements, which is much more than the national average. So I was quite reassured. I was able to say to my mum, look, this guy knows what he's doing. He's done it before. You're not going to be the first. So that was quite reassuring. The web page also shows you something about his outcomes in terms of mortality, which Matt just looked at. Okay, so he showed you before what's called a funnel plot. Well, there's funnel plots for every doctor in, in England um, compared to other doctors doing similar things. So this is the funnel plot for everybody who has done knee replacements in England over a three-year period. And essentially what it shows here is this is the doctor, David Duffy. He's right down the bottom here. Okay, this is the national average mortality, 90-day mortality rate for people who've had knee replacements. This is the confidence interval. Nobody's above it. This doctor who's going to treat my mum is well below it. Of course, for, the risk for knee replacements mortality is quite low, but even above, beyond that low risk, I was able to say to my mum, it's probably okay, you're not going to die. So again, that was quite reassuring. But then she said to me, you know, I don't know if I want to do this operation, even if the doctor's great. Will I feel any better? And I thought, how am I going to answer that? I thought what I could do as a researcher is I could look at the evidence. I could find out what clinical trials have been Done, and then I could see what the average effect is post-surgery of somebody who's had a knee replacement. But actually, that source of information is pretty useless for three reasons. The first reason is it's an average effect. And as those of you who have met my mother, like Pow, would know, my mother isn't average. <laughs> Secondly, the people who get enrolled into clinical trials are really different from the people who are treated in routine practice in hospitals. Only about 2% of people who get treated in hospitals get enrolled in clinical trials, and they are systematically different to everybody else in hospital. So actually, it's really hard to generalise from clinical trial results to what goes on in normal practice. And the third reason, of course, is Nobody does clinical trials of knee replacements. So that wasn't going to be a source of information that I could use to answer my mum's question. So instead, what I did was ask her to fill in a questionnaire, which has been used a lot of times in clinical trials. I asked her to fill in the EQ5D. And it's called the EQ5D because if you fill it in, you're asked to ask about your health according to five different dimensions. Mobility, self-care, usual activities, pain and discomfort, and anxiety and depression. 
And for each of those dimensions, you have to give one of three responses. So for mobility, you're asked if you have no problems walking about, you've got some problems walking about, or you're confined to bed. So I got my mum to fill that questionnaire in. So then, of course, I knew what her st health status was like before she had surgery. That's really useful information. But it isn't much useful information if you want to find out what your health status is going to be six months, 12 months after surgery. However, in England, we've been collecting this data since 2009. In fact, between 2009 and 2016, half a million people have filled this questionnaire in. They've completed the EQ5D before they had surgery, and then either three months or six months afterwards. And those people fall into two groups. We have data before and after surgery for 185 people, 5,000 people who've had hip replacement. 200,000 people who've had knee replacement, and 114,000 people who've had groin hernia repair. So we can use this information to find out if people get better. So I thought, oh, I can actually answer my mum's question. We can actually ask, answer the question, not only do you get better on average, but also do your outcomes after surgery differ from one type of patient to another. So, what we did was took all this data, I did this with my colleague Niels Gutacker, and I'll give you the reference later, to see whether we can allocate patients who've had knee replacement or hip replacements to groups according to their similarities in terms of their post-treatment outcomes. And to do this, we're going to use a technique called classification and regression tree analysis. And this is exactly the same an um, algorithm that is used to construct diagnoses-related groups, with which most of you will be fam familiar. Essentially, di diagnoses-related groups are designed to allocate groups of patients into similar groups, similar being expect expected resource use. Here, I want to put people into similar groups, but they are going to be similar in terms of their outcomes. But essentially, the methodology is exactly the same thing. And essentially, it works. You build this tree up with a bunch of branches, and the branches reflect conjunctions of different patient characteristics, and each branch ends in a leaf. And your leaf is a group allocation. So we have a bunch of branch splitting variables that we used for this process, which were age, gender, your pre-treatment health score, and your symptom duration. And I described the method, we described the methodology in this paper. But this is what it looks like pictorially. This is what the tree looks like for hip replacements. So what you do is you start watering it with your data. We had 185,000 patients. And then we start splitting the patients up into different branches using these different characteristics of, their pay, of, their, uh, of them. So, for instance, you go down a different three-way branch if you had no problems walking about, some problems walking about, you were confined to bed, and then if you were confined to bed, you might be split according to whether you're male or female, or whether you're different ages and so on and so forth. And then at the end, you end up with all these little leaves which are your different outcome groups. So essentially, that's what the little tree looks like. We end up with a whole bunch of different groups where everybody in that group has similar expected outcomes based on these characteristics. Now, of course, you can have loads and loads of groups, and if you want, you can just go to the end where you have so many characteristics that everybody ends up in their same group. You have to have some stopping rule, and those stopping rules could be statistical, or, well, I'll tell you what the stopping rule was that we used in a moment or two. So what we ended up was, were distinct group outcome groups for our three conditions. We had 55 different groups for hip replacements, 59 for knee replacements, and 60 for groin hernia repair. 
So, my mum filled in her questionnaire. Right, Marcos, Pedro, you've got your computers open, you always have. Open them up, go to this website, aftermysurgery.org.uk. So, you can't all do this, so I'm going to walk you through how to use the website. So, Niels and I put together this website. You go to this website, and it's got all the data hidden behind it. And you can choose whether you're going to have a hip replacement, a knee replacement, or you're going to have a groin hernia replacement. Yep, yeah, there you go, you're in. Right. So what you're asked to do is fill in some data about yourself. These are your patient characteristics. So we don't have too many because this questionnaire, this website was designed to be used by patients and GPs in a 10 minute consultation. So essentially you just need a few things to fill in. So this was the questionnaire that I asked my mum to fill in. I could answer some of these for, for myself of course because the first thing is your age, the second thing is your gender, then you're asked how many years you've had the symptoms related to your problem, and then you fill in the EQ5D. So you fill that in, do it on behalf of your mother or your grandmother or whatever, and then you then get compared to other people who've had knee replacements in the past who have answered exactly the same way that you've had. So if you fill something in, then you get some results. And essentially, this tells you how people felt six months after surgery. I and mean, it doesn't give you a statistic, it just gives you a little plot like this. So, of 100 people who were just like you six months after surgery, 93 of those people felt noticeably better. Four didn't feel any different, and three felt noticeably worse. And we can drill down, we can look at their mob mob mobility, for the numbers that I put in, we find that 47% uh, had no problems walking about, about 50% had some problems walking about, 60%, 88% had no problems with self-care. So I filled that in for my mum and found that actually 90 or so percent said they felt better. People who were similar to her. So she was able then to say, I was able to then to say, Mum, given what we know about everybody else like you who have had knee replacements over the last few years, 90% or so say they feel better afterwards, six months afterwards. So I'm pleased to say that 12, 18 months after her operation, my mother doesn't complain about the pain in her knee anymore, she's able to walk about. It's just a non-issue now. She's forgotten all the anxiety that she had about having a knee replacement because she's better. She made the right decision and she made the right decision based on really good information. Doesn't mean she's not got lots to complain about. She moans about completely different things nowadays, but she doesn't say anything at all about her knee. So, of course, we were able to say something about this because we were able to get this information. We had this information available to us and we had the inf this information because of that tragedy that happened in the 1990s where children in the Bristol Royal Infirmary were dying more than was expected. And as a result of that tragedy, action was taken. The cardiothoracic surgeries changed their practice. They started to collect, analyze, and compare information. That then led on to other doctors, other, medi other medical specialties doing the same thing, encouraged to do the same thing by the government. But it took a tragedy to, to do that. It took the tragedy of children, babies, dying in a hospital before action was taken. Prior to that, the medical profession, profession protected itself. Instead of protecting the patients, the families that they were supposed to be serving. And I don't think that it's acceptable that we are protecting those who do violence or cause harm we shouldn't be protecting those people. The state and the authorities should be not protecting those sorts of people. They ought to be protecting 
the people that are using the health service. The first rule in hospital, as Florence Nightingale says, is do no harm. My question is, can we be assured that harm is not being done? And can we do something about it? Now, before this happened, how would we have got information in England? What we would have done is gone to ask our GP. They might have been able to tell us where to go for surgery. They might have then referred us to one of their friends, somebody they went to medical school with. We trusted that they would make the right decision. On the basis of what information? I don't know. Or we might have asked our friends, people who work in, the, in hospitals or nurses, doctors, people we know, if we were lucky enough to know somebody who works in those environments. But lucky enough is not good enough. It's not good enough that we have to seek out information just because we are fortunate enough to know somebody who works within the hospital sector. That excludes whole groups of people who don't have those connections, who aren't articulate, they have no voice. They are not assured that they will be protected and will not come to harm as a result of their contact with the health service. And what happened before we had this information if harm was done? What happened to the families of these parents? Uh, the, par the parents of these children who died? What happened to, to the people who came to other sorts of harm? How did they get redress? How could their tragedy feed into making the system better? Well, there were no institutional arrangements by which it happened. How their voices were heard were really by them going to court or through the media. And the reason this inquiry happened was because this satirical magazine, Private Eye, you may have come across it, essentially for years collected the data, heard the voices of the whistleblowers, heard the voices of the families, and pressed the government to take action. The recourse that we had prior to these systems being put in place in the UK was essentially through the media for individuals acting by themselves. That isn't good enough because it doesn't mean that everybody's complaints are heard and it certainly doesn't mean that future tragedies are avoided. What do you do in Barcelona? You probably know that if you have a stroke or a heart attack, you're better off having it close to clinic or Val de Hebron than if you're in Rosas or Reyes or Manresa. You know that, and you probably have some feeling that the outcomes are going to be better if you're treated in Val de Hebron than somewhere else. But you don't know how much better, and you don't know how much worse in other places. There's no systematic data that you can access that tells you what the relative performances is uh, across your health sector in Catalonia. You can look up on Generalitat some general statistic at, ho at hospital level. You know, you can find out how, much, how many surgeries were performed in clinic. You can find out what the death rate is. My mum doesn't want to know what the death rate is in clinic. She wanted to know what the death rate was associated with the person who was going to do her operation. You don't have that information in Catalonia. That does not mean that harm is not being done to members of your society. How do you find out about it? Again, through the media. It comes up occasionally and you learn about it if it gets in the newspapers. It's not good enough that the people who are harmed or the families of those that have harmed have, uh, can only go to, through the media or the courts to get redress. And then the only mechanism for changing behaviour is through this rather painful, difficult process. This can change. It can change if there is a willingness amongst the population and amongst the medical profession and amongst your government to change things. It took a tragedy in England for this information to be made available, for us to be able to 
hold our medical profession to account. It's taken a similar tragedy, again of babies dying unnecessarily in a small hospital in Australia, for the Australians to start to do the same thing. I hope you don't have to have a tragedy where lots of babies die before you take similar action to make this information available in Barcelona. And there doesn't have to be a tragedy. You can, there have been enough, actually. But you can change things now based on the experience that have ha we have had in, in the UK, based on what's happening now in Australia. And you can start to change your society and the way that the medical profession analyzes and compares information. And until you do that, you cannot be assured that the medical profession is serving its own interests, protecting itself, or protecting the population. So, I would urge you to start agitating. I know you've got lots of other things to agitate for at the moment, but this is one thing that you can agitate for. Now, I can give you the little technology for you to adopt of that little spreadsheet, of that little web page, whereby you can look at whether you're going to get better as a, result of your, uh, as a result of your surgery. You can use it, you can share it, you can translate it. So you can adopt that technology. The patients who answered questionnaires in England are going to be quite similar to those who are treated in Catalonia, in Spain, in Portugal. So that is of general value. But I can't give you the technology to allow you to work out whether your doctors are any good and whether some of them actually might be doing more harm than good. That has to come from yourself. So I'm going to give you that little bit of spreadsheet for you to play with and I'll give you three wishes. The first wish is, with your efforts, I wish that the health system is going to get better. I'm going to wish you a better future and I'm going to wish you all peace. So, muchas gracias por su invitación, por Oh, so uh, attention and one another. Questions or at least response. So thank you very much, Andrew. I am quite spectacular as usual. Um, I think your advice um, is very nice, although, as you said, we are quite busy now. Uh, but I think it's interesting and important. Um, I, I have one question. So you presented two kind, two different types of things. Uh, one is the doctor type of information and the other one is more related to the patients. Is there any way that you can, because which one, I was thinking, well, if I have to choose, which one should I trust more? Is there any way to integrate the two of them? So do you have any information or that, I mean, for me, the best would be if I can add information on the questionnaires about the doctor that was treated. Yeah. Maybe not individual information on the name, but maybe, you know, tenure and yeah. uh, region and yeah. things like that. So I can, in one single spreadsheet, I can integrate both uh, dimensions. Yeah. Uh, so, so these are outcome data are all actually linked to each individual patient's hospital record. So that's, that's why we're able to do all this risk adjustment and use that to create these, um, these patient characteristics. Some of it comes directly from the questionnaire they fill in, but also we can get additional characteristics from the medical record. But also what we've been able to do is then analyze whether the hospital in which patients are treated is a is, is a factor in explaining the outcomes that patients experience. So in other work, we've done quite a bit to look at whether patient outcomes, variation in patient outcomes are related to, the, to, to hospitals. And in fact, we find that they are. So, so yeah, we did, in the hospital, and our, um, the hospital data we have, we're only able to identify the specialty. So our results are all reported at individual specialty level, which might just be with one doctor, but might have a collection. But that's still pretty useful. It means that the hospital can see, in this specialty, we seem to have worse outcomes than other hospitals doing the same thing, which is not related to their 
the characteristics of the patients. And that allows hospital management to go in and say, or the hospital doctors themselves, to say, why are we different? Why, as a team, are, we, are our patients experiencing worse outcomes than others? Thank you, Andy. It was very interesting. Uh, just, uh, it's important for what you explained at the beginning of the doctors. Uh, it's, it's relevant for them, for them to compete between them, for hospitals too. But do you, are you aware of patients using it properly? So do they have all this information quite available and have they been used on it? So, so the, t the two elements of, of data are the, the hospital performance data that is basically provided nat nationally. So anybody can use that information and basically the NHS has invested quite a lot of money in putting the, the first set of data sets up and keeping them up to date. So and I think they are quite u well used. I don't know how much they're used, but essentially they are a free public resource for anyone to use. Our little uh, website, we put together basically working with local general practitioners within the York area. So the reason we had just a few things to put in our questionnaire was because the doctor said, well, within a 10-minute consultation, uh, there's only so much we can fill in and discuss the implications of those results. So essentially, we put this together because the local GPs were saying to us, patients are coming and they're not sure whether to have surgery or not. We don't really know what to advise them. We think some people might be having surgery. If they had better information, they would decide not to bother if they thought that the outcomes that they experience are not going to be actually as good as they think they would. So we're now trying to follow up with them just to see how often they've been using those, this um, tool uh, in their consultations with people having these, these, three, con these three conditions. Um, and then on the tool itself, we've got counters seeing how many used it and so on and so forth. So you know, one of our impact evaluations will be to see if anybody's used it. But please use it. You can. This is a question for the three. because uh, So the three of you have been using DRG in some way or another to adjust for risk. So if, if we think that there might be DRG upcoding, so you know some hospitals might put people into worse categories because then they get more money. And some of the variation that we see in the data, they might not be driven by different results, but just because you know, someone looks, someone is put into a very severe case to get more money but actually, and have good outcomes because it wasn't so severe. So uh, you know, this, is, I think, has been documented quite a bit in the US. Do we, do we think that this DRG upcoding also goes on in the UK? And, and is it? Something, a problem you perceive? Yeah. So, so I, I think that the, the upcoding bit is something that uh, is going on uh, across uh, many countries, but uh, even more as the DRG system gets refined. Uh, the microphone is not. The mic, put it back in. Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, let's try. Is this working now? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so, so I think that the, the, you know, the, when the DRG system came in place, there was like 500 tariffs, and then uh, over time they just like get more and more. Like so, that is like 1,000, and then down to 2,000. 2000. 2000. So, so, so this clearly creates the, the problem of upcoding. So I'm pretty sure that uh, that this is going on, and I think I see more and more papers that whenever they try to test for upcoding, that they find evidence for it. Um, I think the question there is more about the payment as opposed to the health of the patient, in the sense that you, you know, the, the funder is paying too much money. It doesn't mean that to be just because you upcode the patient that uh, you're harming the patient. So, so in that sense, I think that's quite distinct from uh, some of the issues that uh, Andy was referring to. So, so, so yeah, so I think that that's the way to approach it. So, so you know, what can you do about that? Well, either you scale down on the number of DRG refinement that you keep doing, uh, or you start to put good auditing uh, in place. Uh, this, uh, but, but I always wonder how much auditing, effective auditing mechanisms are in place at the moment. Maybe some, someone else knows, knows the answer to that. 
So the National Audit Office, when it looked at that about five years ago, didn't find very much upcoding going on. And until very recently, um, and they think it's related to PRGs were rolled out to have a 30-day window, and then a three-month window for readmissions in the States for Medicare. And uh, until that happened, they didn't think there was much upcoding, but as Luigi says, as they roll it out further, they're, they're, they're a, a bigger penalty of loss for these <coughs> readmission rates, and therefore they do tend to channel people off into different PRGs now, it seems. So, like any system, you put the incentive in place, somebody's going to work it. Monitoring and auditing is obviously one way to go, but it's costly. Other questions? Can I ask, actually, Andrew, a couple of questions? So, um, can you get, let me see if I get this right, the QE5D for a doctor? for David Duffy. Sorry. Uh, Can you get the, the QE5D, I think, the questionnaire yeah, that you have yeah, the questionnaire. On, uh, for, a particular, for a particular doctor? So you have an average, national average, right? No, uh, no. I, I mean, as I said to Judith, we have the oh. data. Oh, yeah. similar question. So, okay. yeah, w w I mean, in theory, the, 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 the I, I can't because I don't have a, uh, the identifiers of the doctors in the data set, but they are there, so, but they're restricted access to those data. But the, the national data center is able to scrutinize those data at individual doctor level. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's feasible to do. And the data are there, it's not very hard to do. Okay. And when I've analyzed, when we've analyzed the data with hospital identifiers or departmental identifiers, that's the closest that's the lowest level of disaggregation we can get in our version of the data. Uh, but that's pretty revealing. It does show, you know, there is quite substantive, unexplained var variation that is related to the organization or the department in which patients are treated. So there is variation. There are performance issues in, in relation to this particular measure of performance. Understood. And the other question that I had is uh, more thinking about the aggregate. So imagine that all of us um, use that tool. Yep. Uh, we may all want to use or to go to David Duffy, but David Duffy it's, has an amount of time. So I'm wondering whether the fact that he is that good is making other doctors also, you know, creates incentives for other doctors to be to like move, him. For people to and, move. Well, this could be a number I, of effects, right? So, but uh, you see that happening. That's the question. Yeah. So, so yeah. So it might well be the case that people start to select and move around the system. Of course, they're gonna make their choices based on a variety of things in their utility function, you know, the distance, the inconvenience, and the quality, and so on and so forth. So not everybody's just gonna zone in on the top of the, of the rankings. Um, and they might weight things differently as well. Vol some people might vol weigh volume more highly, and others are positioned within the funnel plot, and so on. Um, but, yeah, there might well be some reallocation around the system, and that might not be a bad thing. So patients might change. Most of the evidence, though, about how patient, uh, the response to publication of these data suggests that patients don't tend to move around very much. There isn't much effective patient choice. Most people go to the nearest hospital, the nearest doctor. The mechanism by which this information tends to improve things is that the doctors themselves start to analyze their behavior with comparative information and say, for some reason we seem not to be doing, I don't seem to be doing so well, I need to improve because basically I'm being named and shamed. And that is the more powerful mechanism by which improvements can happen. It's pu the publication is a spur for self-reflection and improvement. Yeah, I mean, j j just to complement on uh, uh, and this uh, point, so, so I think there is quite a lot of uh, literature that uh, estimate choice model, like conditional choice models, uh, as a function of quality and distance. There are many studies from the US that they have been uh, doing in the last uh, 20, 30 years, and then I think we are catching up. So we have done one with using the prompts with Niels, 
uh, and the MQ. And uh, I mean, these studies, uh, as I said, like they say all the same things. Distance is the big predictor. So even at the moment, if the, the data are uh, available in the public domain at hospital level, people do not act on this. Or they, if they do, these effects are tiny. So, and even the studies on public reporting, uh, I mean, I've seen recently some more for nursing homes as opposed to hospitals. But again, I mean, you find, uh, sometimes I say that, you know, you take any health economic study, you always find an assist of 0 0.1. Uh, that, that still applies to, 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 to that, that question. So, so I think we're, there is really a long way to go before these concerns uh, become really uh, important that uh, you really have to think about, re you know, shutting down some hospital just because no one wants to go there. Uh, but in the same lines, um, do you think that can create in, uh, in inequalities? Because uh, maybe those like you, higher educated, will go to the best uh, doctors, and and then those that are but maybe if not choice, aware. If people aren't really making choices, if patients aren't moving, then there's. If, they, if people, people were making choices and actually moving around the system, then I would be concerned. Yeah. But if actually the, it's an internal yeah. professional change, then I think the risk of inequality getting worse by the public, publication of information is going to be ameliorated. It's, it's not such a concern. Yeah, maybe they are not moving on average, but maybe if you look at like big, uh, big yeah. um, regions, or like big cities, yeah. where you have uh, the where distance is not a problem. Yeah. But one can, one can look into that. I mean, my concern is, you know, first of all, let's get the level up. Let's yeah, make right. sure yeah, that yeah. the level changes yeah. and then see whether there are adverse consequences yeah. across the distribution. But, you know, my primary my, what, but in the, the, the UK government in the 10 years ago or 15 years ago was basically saying the mechanism to change things is to in, introduce competition, to get people choosing. And I always thought that isn't going to work. What I want is my local hospital to be good. I don't want it to be. I don't want to be sent off to somewhere else. I don't want to be feeling that I'm having to be choose between this place here and somewhere somewhere else. I want both of those hospitals to be yeah. good, and that's what we've moved to now. They've said, well, competition isn't a particular driver for yeah. improvement. These other mechanisms, more regulatory and professional mechanisms, might be more powerful instruments to get things better for everybody. Can I top up? Yeah, so, so again, if you look at the choice uh, models, the empirical choice models, which you know, maybe you could run, uh, I don't think there are some catalog studies, maybe you, you could, could do the first one. Uh, so, so, so normally it's quite simple to implement in the sense that you just interact the quality effect or the distance effects with some characteristics. So I think that the, 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 the dimension that most people have in mind from the US literature is severity. So I think what most people think when they summarize the evidence is that more severe patients are more willing to travel for an increase in quality. The education bit maybe is there as well, but uh, I think the effect is smaller. So if you're thinking about the severity one, then you might think actually that mm. you want that. Uh, for the education, maybe that w might uh, increase a little bit uh, inequalities, but there are so many other inequalities that yeah, I'm right. not sure whether the, 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 this is, would be my ma major concern. Okay, thank you. So has there been on the table uh, a discussion on, on relocating doctors, though? Not a crazy relocation, but maybe, you know short distance relocations of doctors that could have improved the fact that in your local hospital you have a good doctor at least. Uh -oh. Is that on the table? It's, it's not doable? It's feasible? So, so hospitals are responsible for their hiring and firing decisions. Okay, so there isn't a sort of central mechanism by which you're sent to work here and there, which might be different here uh, in Spain. But basically, hospitals are autonomous in uh, who they hire, and, and you know their staffing decisions are their own choice. In principle, in part of the hiring discussion, I would suspect those on the interview panel would look at these data. You know, you want to find out not just read the CV, but actually look at this information. So it's certainly information that is used to, or information of this nature is used to revalidate doctors to see whether they stay uh, are staying on top of their profession, keeping up to date with the latest technologies and so on and so forth. So that's one thing that, not moving from one place to another, but making sure that they are meeting the, standard, the, the standards required to remain in the profession. 
but it could, I mean, I would be very surprised if this information were not being used by interview panels uh, considering appointing people. Okay, so let's draw it to a close. It's been a long but lovely day. Uh, I want to thank five people or three um, presenters just now. Um, Albert, who's at the back, and Raul, uh, our local organizers. And I'll hand over to you in a moment after we thank you to explain the map. So thanks very much. Thank you.